We were getting ready to go into combat. We didn't know where, naturally. At that stage of the game, everything was hush hush. November 20th, 1943, the start of one of the bloodiest battles of World War II, Tarwa. I was sitting, loading a camera with my back to the seawall and watching the boats coming in. And as soon as the ramp went down, a shell landed in the boat. 76 hours after it began, the fighting was over. Over 1,000 U.S. Marines and sailors dead, over 2,000 injured, in a victorious battle for a small but strategic island in the South Pacific. It was one of the first battles that, of World War II that the people really saw. And that uh, was an eye opener. Almost 70 years later, military teams are returning to Tarwa, this time in hopes of bringing their fallen brothers in arms back home. Cinch it down, just not over tighten it, but cinch it down. This is pretty much a promise from the United States government to their, to their acting okay. service members and the families of those service members that they'll do everything in their power to uh, bring their lost loved ones home. Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. JPAC, the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command, travels the world, searching for and bringing home those left behind on the battlefield. Their mission to Tarwa is a first, and one that is marked by unique challenges. Tarwa is a very busy place. It's, uh, it's crowded. Uh, there's been a lot of land disturbance. The exact location of individual graves are not well known. We have general locations. Uh, but it will be a challenge in a number of uh, different ways to recover because of the disturbance and the crowding. The Battle of Tarwa was also a first. The first major amphibious offensive attack in the Pacific and the first time that graphic combat footage shot by military cameramen was shown to the American public, an event that would alter the way the country saw the war. We knew that we were getting ready to go into combat. We didn't know where, naturally. At that stage of the game, everything was hush-hush except for the generals and the staff. Retired Marine Norman Hatch was in the thick of the fighting on Tarwa, but his view of the battle was through the objective lens of a camera. The only photography that I was involved in uh, in high school, we had a photo class, and, uh, or, you know, a club. And so uh, we were all running around with little Kodaks and things like that. And I, I had a little basic knowledge about photography because we had to process our own film and things of that nature. But uh, I knew nothing about movies one way or the other. I thought that to be able to get into the march of time and to learn how to use a camera to tell a story would be what I wanted to do. Six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Norm Hatch was on his way to the Pacific and in the fall of 1943 left for the Tarwa Atoll. When the flotilla of ships finally reached their destination, they were met with a barrage of unexpected gunfire. For some reason or other, neither the naval gunfire nor the naval air managed to silence those eight-inch rifles that the Japanese had on the other side of the island, which caused so much devastation with our landing craft. I was sitting, loading a camera with my back to the seawall and watching the boats coming in, and as soon as the ramp went down, a shell landed in the boat. Blew everybody to smithereens in the boat as well. And this happened boat after boat after boat. And they finally stopped them. They, you know, they, they called out to the command ship and said, don't send any more boats in. It was those eight-inch rifles. They, they knew what the edge of the reef was. They already had that set up. And so all they had to do was just wait till that ramp went down, fire, and that was it. We had to get out and wait 400 yards through terrific crossfire. A sniper was firing at these men. When you're in a military service, any, any kind of a military service, and you have a job to do, uh, you're trained to do that job, and uh, it's no different, a cameraman, for example, would be no different than a mortarman or a rifleman or uh, a pilot or anybody else. That, uh, uh, when, 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 when the uh, you-know-what hits the fan, uh, you get that adrenaline rush 
that moves you into doing what you're supposed to do. And therefore, uh, guys, I'd walk up along in what was then would be considered a front line. They'd say, what are you doing here? You don't have to be here. And I say, yes, I do. I have to be here because the public won't know what we're doing. It's my job. I've got to be here to tell what you guys are doing one way or the other. You just couldn't randomly shoot this and this and this and this. You had to shoot this and this over here and back again with this because this was a story going on. So admittedly, I knew that I had a target on my back because 90% of the time I was standing up. A lot, of the, a lot of the troops were on their hands and knees or laying down shooting uh, or, you know, or a few would get up to stand or do, depending on whatever they did. But, but I, I couldn't shoot laying down. I, I couldn't get enough, uh, you know, what was going on. Uh, I did go down a couple of times when there was a loud explosion pretty near me, but, uh, but uh, it didn't stay down because, like I say, you can't <laughs> shoot from the ground. This was the first time in the history of warfare that there was complete camera coverage of a battle. It took only three days for Tarwa to become a deadly chapter in U.S. military history. And once his films were shown, Norm Hatch and the footage he shot became well known. What was not well known was how long it would be before the military could return to the island on their mission to bring fallen Marines and sailors back home. Every time I get hot, every time I get tired, I find myself uh, shaking it off and reminding myself that my father, who served quite a bit of time in Vietnam, if he wasn't with our family today, I'd want somebody out there digging for him. California has a unique port. Besides hosting the Queen Mary and dozens of working oil wells, the Port of Long Beach processes $100 billion of cargo each year, making it the second busiest port in America. Our economy uh, is very dependent on having goods moving through this port complex, and it needs to be protected. It's been identified as a potential target for terrorists, and so the law enforcement agencies, and especially the armed forces that protect this complex, are very vital to us. On the high seas, the cargo is under the watchful eyes of Navy forces. As it nears Long Beach, the Coast Guard takes over, inspecting the ships and protecting the harbor. The containers load directly onto truck frames and rail cars, beginning their journey across the country to store shelves. But the chain of commerce starts with a shield of protection provided by our maritime forces. Sea Control, protecting America's ports and commerce, another key mission of our maritime force. There are those who dedicate themselves to a sense of honor, to a life of courage, and a commitment to something greater than themselves. They have always defended this nation and each other. They still do. The few, the proud, the Marines. Hi, I'm Maury Deason. You're watching SCV TV, local television for Santa Clarita. Right now, we're doing all the preparation for this mission. Uh, we're going to the islands of Tarawa. And our job right now is to search and look for the remains of the missing Marines out there, bring them back home safely. It's a very rewarding experience once to meet the families, people who held the faith for a very, very long time that uh, their loved ones will be returned to them. So it's very, very satisfying. 
Tarwa is not Dr. Gregory Fox's first JPAC mission, but it could prove to be one of the most difficult. The entire island was bulldozed uh, after the battle. Uh, the cemeteries were rearranged into more ceremonial than exact loss locations. Uh, many of the cemeteries were already partially recovered by Army Graves registration. So you have all the empty, uh, empty graves there that we have to sort through to find those few who uh, perhaps were not recovered from their excavations in 1946. Uh, the island is heavily populated. The houses are very close together. Uh, the land surface itself has been disturbed in multiple different directions. The general locations are known. The specific locations of the individuals who have yet to be recovered are not known. So it's us to not only discover, but to recover those individuals as well. The challenges on Tarawa are complex. Many Marines never made it to shore alive. The topography of the island has changed dramatically over 70 years, and in some instances, public works and buildings have been built where burials may have taken place. Despite enormous hurdles, the JPAC team was clear as to the focus of its mission. So we have uh, six sites here, all of them related to uh, with the exception of the one right here, a cemetery, uh, a post-battle cemetery that may have uh, additional Americans remaining in it. We're just for fairly rapid burials. They were trying to be as consistent as possible, but it was a very difficult task uh, in a very, truly blown-up environment. We're going to do initial discovery trench and then probably bring a backhoe in to strip a lot of the soil off, make it go a little bit faster. and. Once we get down close to the approximate level that we think is sterile soil or a burial feature, we'll uh, go back to hand excavation. Uh, but that remains to be seen here. Well, once we've determined what's down there, uh, can't just blindly start digging because the graves could be shallow, they could be deep. Uh, we're prepared to go all the way to the water table. Army Graves Registration recovered some of the graves in the water table. We have submersible pumps to take care of those types of issues. Uh, so we're prepared for anything. It's just we don't know what's here. Dr. Fox and the JPAC team move carefully from site to site. This work is painstakingly detailed and requires the complete dedication of those involved in the excavation. The experience of Dr. Fox to understand the importance of fines and the cooperation of the local government and residents to support the mission. Basically what I did, I tried to pull all the visible long bones out of this. I don't want to get a lot of weight in there. I don't want the transport to, to uh, damage these any more than they've already been damaged. That's a large ammunition belt, about the size of a BAR belt. Uh, ammunition belt. So that could be a clue to lead us into a short list with this separate set of remains. I don't know how many people's in there or anything else like that, but that's something worth retaining as a clue, circumstantial evidence uh, that will help us identify an individual. We're going to close these up, seal them with evidence tape, date. Uh, initial and date the evidence tape and then we're going to, I have to fill out a chain of custody. This is basically a tamper control system. This tape is very fragile. It's a very specific tape. If you tear it, if you tear my initials through there, you can't reproduce it. This is, this is ready for transport back to the uh, JPEG cell. There were two separate unilateral turnovers. The, the local officials do not have the same scientific forensic orientation that we do, so they accept them, they keep them. Uh, they don't work on not commingling. It's no fault of their own. It's a training issue. But as it is, we're happy that they gave it to us. Uh, we're ecstatic that they bother to do that. So we're going to do this. We have uh, information that the, uh, the Beijo police have additional remains. And so tomorrow we'll try to pick up the other remains. We'll try to go out to where they were. 
We'll try to get a GPS location there. As I understand from speaking to Captain Nordman, it's very close to one of the sites we have scheduled. So it may actually be within one of the sites we have scheduled. That remains to be seen. It's brutally hot on Tarawa, and the days are long. With several sites yet to excavate and explore, Dr. Fox and his team have their work laid out for them. But it's a job that this team takes on with the heart of the mission in mind. You know, I love my job just because, I mean, I chose this job. A lot of mortuary affairs, you know, got, kind of got stuck in that position because, um, you know, either they're colorblind or they didn't rate high enough on their ASVAB test to, to, to do anything else. But there's actually a few of us out there that actually truly wanted to do this, and I was one of those people. You know, I, I enjoy the, the fact of bringing closure to the family. So, and JPAC is great at that because that's, that's our mission is searching for our fallen that, that are still out there in the other countries and then bringing them back. Six inches. Stop. And we're building this screening station so that we can screen the uh, dirt that comes out of the excavation site. Um, so it'll go through these ha this uh, quarter mesh over here and any remains will stay in the screens. So we want a fairly sturdy platform to get this all set up, and that's what we're doing right now. And you might get numb to the digging, to the process, but as soon as you get to that point where, oh wow, we have remains, um, it, different emotions come over, and uh, obviously you're gonna treat that circumstance with a lot of respect. It does take patience, you know, uh, from a scientific standpoint, science is by necessity long-term, tedious, and, and boring. Uh, but given the, given the changes in the landscape of this island, given the changes immediate in the landscape immediately after the battle, uh, certainty here is an exception, not a rule. Uh, not to be flippant, but they're missing for a reason, because they're missing. We don't know where they are exactly. We have the general locations of these cemeteries, we're in proximity to these cemeteries, but being five meters off might be five, might as well be 500 miles off. Okay. Ready to be flipped. And obviously, we can't go into this landscape and strip the entire island. Uh, there, are, there are people who live here, that, and it's their republic now. I mean, we're we're guests of a host nation, and we operate with some restrictions. We certainly don't want to disrupt their lives any more than we would want people coming into our neighborhoods and disrupting our lives. The JPAC team moves to another location, this time a bit further inland. It could prove to have suffered a smaller amount of disturbance than the first two sites. Still, the team faces yet a new challenge. Well, at first when I heard that they, like they're going to dig this, uh, the front yard and I was uh, I was a bit, uh, a bit sad because it means that they're going to remove my plants, purple plants. Then they explain everything and uh, you know, I started to, you know, feel okay. And when I hear the purpose of the digging, that they're going to, you know, look for the bones and, uh, and uh, I think it's really, you know, I really uh, admire that, uh, uh, that, like, uh, uh, it's really, uh, it's really important that they, you know, that that kind of work. So I, I don't mind. Uh, oh, what's been going on? Here. All the buckets. Put them into the buckets. No, 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 no. no. Put it in a wheelbarrow and get it over because I need this dug out. It appears like we may have some possible human remains in the corner of this, but I can't tell anything until I dig that down that down and this down. So what we're doing now is we were digging a test trench. We were taking all of the uh, sediments out of the trench and stockpile it. Now we're going to, uh, what we'd stockpiled from this corner, is, uh, right here in this corner, we're gonna screen all that. We're taking, we're taking a trowel. We've gone from uh, gross excavation techniques to fine scale excavation teeth. So from here on out in this corner, once we get down low enough, it's going to be dental picks, wooden probes, paint brushes. Uh, one yeah. human tooth. From one tooth, you can find the DNA of a person. So that's this is the kind of stuff that you want to find. This is, stuff, this is the stuff we're looking for.
I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. I live the Army values. I will never. I will never. I will never accept defeat. I am disciplined, physically and mentally tough. I am a professional. I am a professional. I am the guardian of freedom. And the American way of life. I am an American soldier. I am the Army National Guard. Defend freedom. In the Army National Guard, you can. Visit 1-800-GO-GUARD.COM today. Hey, bud. It's time to get up. Let's go. Hey, don't forget you got the football trials today. I know. Let's go, bud. Got your lunchbox? Yeah, can I drive? No. Check that out. The team from JPAC left Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, hoping to bring some of the fallen from the Battle of Tarawa back home. It's a long and tedious process, but on this new site, a glimmer of hope. That's sterile beach sand. Nothing's disturbed it. The team as a whole, uh, we're, we're all here to uh, essentially recover as many uh, biological remains of our U.S. Marines that, that never made it back uh, from the Battle of Tarawa. If we can come out of this as, uh, with as many remains as possible from, from our brethren, that, that would be the ideal turnout. If we just find one set of U.S. remains while we're out here and provide the, the true final story of what happened to that individual, to that family. That in itself is, uh, is something that brings a lot of peace and uh, in harmony to all of our hearts. So uh, success can be defined in many ways, but I'll tell you right now, we've already had great success. Uh, one yeah. human tooth. Oh, From one tooth, you can find the DNA of a person. So that's, this is the kind of stuff that you want to find. This is, stuff, this is the stuff we're looking for. So if you see any big chunks of metal, if it's kind of hollowed out in the middle, you know, make sure you take some time, pry it apart carefully. Uh, you know, we'll try to get the remains out as far back as we can. Um, there's a couple big chunks that definitely have some bone in it. Okay. I am going to ask you uh, for a little bit of water here. Just hit it all. Right there where the, uh, let's go right there. All over here. There you go. Beautiful. That's good. Thank you very much. And that's about the degree to which I will work this. Because that's, yeah, that's got Dr. Fox written all over it. You know, this is, you know, hollow ground for the Marines as far as, you know, these are mostly Marine remains that we're going to be finding out here. But, you know, for me, you know, from the standpoint of being a mortuary affairs specialist, you know, getting these guys home is, is the best thing in the world. Your adrenaline's kind of going, you kind of got to take a deep breath and calm down so you can do some tedious stuff like this and make sure you're not damaging the remains or, you know, not stepping out of line. and dishonoring the remains and whatnot. The hours of digging, sifting, and searching seems to have paid off when the mission uncovers intact skeletal remains. We'll uh, stabilize the evidence in the, in the field. Uh, we'll bring it under a secure chain of custody back here. It'll come in the door. We'll accession in our laboratory and assign it a, a, an accession number, which is basically an analytical number. Uh, we'll do a preliminary analysis of the skeletal remains. We'll make a preliminary assessment of its DNA potential, and the dentist will do a preliminary analysis of the uh, dentition. Uh, then it will go to one of our laboratory managers who will assign the case to an analyst who knows nothing about the case. They do all the uh, skeletal analysis, the biological profile, in the blind so they don't bias their results. 
The dentist, on the other hand, will have to compare it against dental records. We have a database of uh, where all the dental records will be entered, and they'll be able to do a fairly fast comparison there. JPAC toiled on Tarawa for over five weeks and shipped a number of remains and artifacts back to the lab in Hawaii. The difficulty of this mission was not just in recovering remains, but in hearing the results of analysis. In Tarawa this time we were unsuccessful in finding any of those trench burials and part of that problem is that this island has been changed and changed and changed again through development, through the installation of infrastructure such as sewer lines and the bombardment. So we have to sort those out from what we're looking for is the actual remains of U.S. Marines on the island and, and CDs and whoever else is buried there. Although remains were uncovered on Tarawa, they were not remains of U.S. service members. We were not successful in our excavations in recovering any United States personnel. We did get some unilateral turnover that appeared to be United States personnel. Uh, but we have not stopped in our endeavor to recover these individuals and return them to their families. We will take any information that leads us to the recovery of U.S. service members and try to evaluate and examine it both back here for its veracity and in the field, and in in, in field truth it as well. We have ongoing research right now for future excavations, which will, which will come up in our operational plannings as we develop appropriate information. From our experience doing the, the initial excavations on Tarawa, skeletal preservation is excellent. If we can find these cemeteries, the rows or trenches they're buried in, and get a good idea of where they are, we can recover uh, remains that weren't recovered. So we, have a, we, we can get the remains if we can find the remains. We were lucky in the sense in the, in the Marine Corps in that most of all of our battles that we photographed took place and at the most they lasted a month, but they were all self-contained in a small piece of land. Now you take Tarawa, for example, it is one, one third the size of Central Park in New York. In 37 hours, there were over 5,000 people killed and over 1,000 people wounded. Now fortunately for us, and they killed, four over 4,000 were Japanese. But think of all the lead that was flying around in the course of that 76 hours. To hear Norm Hatch recount the story of Tarwa, it becomes possible to wonder how a Marine can be a witness to battle and not become absorbed by the killing that surrounds him. And I often say to reporters, I've talked to many of them over the years, that. You can't get emotionally involved in your story or you won't tell it right. And so uh, I felt along the same way with the camera that, that I'm there to state what's happening because if I don't do that, the people at home won't get a true story of what it is. And I don't know whether that is a, stems from the fact that I was not intimately involved with any of the people that were hurt or killed that I sh shot pictures of. I didn't know them, didn't know their brother, didn't know them mother and father or anybody that, you know, like that. So uh, it was good that I didn't, because if I didn't, I might have stopped shooting. But Norm Hatch kept shooting, and his images helped to change the way Americans viewed the war. 70 years later, his memories are vivid, and the reality of the JPAC mission on Tarwa clear. Well, I wouldn't have liked having his job of going over dead bodies. Well, I didn't know any were being left behind at that time. There was a burial ceremony. There was a cemetery set up, and we thought that was correct and right to do. We didn't know anything at those days. We weren't adept at knowing anything about Pearl Harbor and, the, and, the, and of course, the tremendous burial situation up, that was going to come up there. It what didn't happen at, at that, that time, you see. So that was before worrying about whether they were coming home or not. You thought that they would eventually, that somebody would come out to the island once the war was over, and dig all those people up and carry them back. 